real small that people were going to know who I was. I always had that feeling. But I just never knew how they were going to learn. And I kind of enjoy it because now, even after I die, people are going to remember me forever. They're going to talk about me for years. People in West Memphis will tell their kids stories. It, it, it'll be like, sort of like I'm the West Memphis boogeyman. Little kids will be looking under their bed before they go to bed. Damien might be under there. On May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-old boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, were reported missing in West Memphis, Arkansas. The first report to the police was made by Byers' adopted father, John Mark Byers, around 7 p.m. The boys were allegedly last seen together by three neighbors who, in affidavits, told of seeing them playing together around 6.30 p.m. The evening they disappeared and seeing Terry Hobbs, Stevie Branch's stepfather, calling them to come home. A more thorough police search from the children began around 8 a.m. on the morning of May 6th, aided by Crittenden County search and rescue personnel, along with several others. Searchers canvassed all over West Memphis, but focused primarily on Robin Hood Hills, where the boys were reported to be seen last. Despite a human chain making a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder search of Robin Hood Hills, searchers found no sign of the missing boys. Search and rescue personnel broke for lunch at 1 p.m., but police and others continued searching. Around 1.45, juvenile parole officer Steve Jones spotted a boy's black shoe floating in a muddy creek that led to a major drainage canal in Robin Hood Hills. A subsequent search of the ditch found the bodies of three boys. They were stripped naked and had been hogtied with their own shoelaces. Their right ankles tied to their right wrists behind their back and the same with their left limbs. Their clothing was found in the creek. Some of it twisted around sticks that had been thrust into the muddy ditch bed. On June 3rd, the police interrogated Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., Miss Kelly's father gave permission for Jesse to go with the police. Eight months after his original confession, on February 17, 1994, Miss Kelly made another statement to the police. His lawyer, Dan Stidham, remained in the room and continually advised Miss Kelly not to say anything. Miss Kelly ignored this advice and went on to detail how the boys were abused and murdered. And Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., born... July 10th, 1975, was sentenced to life plus 40 years in prison. His conviction was appealed and affirmed by the Arkansas Supreme Court. Three weeks later, Eccles and Baldwin went on trial. The prosecution had accused the three young men of committing murder. And on March 19th, 1994, Eccles and Baldwin were found guilty on three counts of capital murder. The court sentenced Eccles to death and Baldwin to life in prison. Terry Hobbs, stepfather of Stevie Branch, one of the three victims, has been at the center of this case for some time. It's important to note that Terry Hobbs has never been considered a suspect by law enforcement. Not in 1993, not in 2007, not in 2023. However, in 2007, DNA collected from the crime scene was tested, and a hair not inconsistent with Stevie Branch's stepfather, Terry Hobbs, was found tied into the knot used to bind one of the victims. Terry Hobbs agreed to sit down and talk to me about this, and no questions were off limits. While I do believe Jason, Jesse, and Damien are guilty, I'm not adverse to asking questions that should be answered. Terry is candid. He's straight to the point, and he's a man of few words. Terry is constantly harassed and accused of being involved in the murders or being single-handedly responsible for the murders. Naturally, this has taken a toll on Terry over the years, and as the 30th anniversary comes up, 
of the West Memphis Three case. Terry's here to tell us all, everything he knows, everything he remembers. No question is off limits. We talk about his ex-wife Pam and his daughter and the accusations. Does he have an alibi? What about the hair? May 5th, 1993. Do you remember that morning at all? Of course I remember that morning. The boys, <laughs> the boys didn't go missing until... Or they weren't really reported missing until after school, correct? Correct. Yeah, I get up and go to work, and I come home, and Stevie's not home. Now, now you you don't think of they're missing just because they're not home. You know, Pam says he's out playing with Michael, and, and so he left with Michael more. But later on, Christopher hooked up with him, and that's how they became the three. And, you know, and you still don't think of them being missing because it's daylight and, you know, you're riding around looking for them. And, you know, and dark starts to set in. And then, you know, there's a little anxiety because you haven't found them, you know. And so police, police are being called and, you know, and we try, we ask, I think Mark asked for search and rescue and they denied that. And, on this 24-hour federal law, missing persons federal law that they that's in place at the time, and so you know you just you know still ride around, walk around. We did all that, never found nobody. So you know, you had they been missing? Had they ever done that before? Had they ever? I mean, had that ever happened before? Stevie never has. I can't say about the other two boys. Uh huh. And. But, I can say Stevie never done that. So it was out of character completely. Of course, yeah. sure. Yeah. So that morning, you get up, you go to work, you come home. About what time do you come home? Do you remember? It was mid-afternoon. Mm-hmm. You get home mid-afternoon. The boys are missing. And where's Pam at this time? Pam's at home. She's at home getting ready for work and cooking supper. Where, where'd she work at at the time? She worked at a Catfish Island restaurant, and it wasn't too far. As a matter of fact, it's... Right there by Robin Hood at Hills, I guess that's what they called it. Yes. And we didn't know that, but that's right there, really right beside it. Okay, so the night kind of sets in, you know, evening. It's, you, you haven't found the boys. Do you know, just in approximate time, Terry, not, nothing specific, but so you start search, you guys start searching, and there was a bunch of you that started searching and, and looking around. Um, Was Michael Moore's father out there with you guys? No, he was. And so, so we were told that he was a truck driver and he was out of town that night. Okay. So he didn't show up till the next morning, I guess, early the next morning, the 6th. And, and what about um, John Mark Byers? How, how long until you guys were all searching and, and looking around? Well, when I I went to Dana, uh, Dana Moore, Dana Todd's home, uh, we drove by there on my way to work to take Pam to work and I come back by and I stop and I, you know, ask if they'd seen him. They told me no. And so I went on and come back and Mark comes walking across the grass and that's where I first met Mark. So at. you had never met Mark before ever? Well, I met, I'd seen Mark, uh, with, they all went to Cub Scouts together. And I've seen Mark bring Christopher to the Cub Scouts, but I don't think, you know, if we introduced ourselves, that might have been, you know, the bulk of it. But I, I, I didn't know Mark. You know, the relationship after that, and we'll talk, we can talk about that, was uh, up and down. Mark was a very interesting guy. It was very troubled life as well. And, um, you know, recent, when I say recently, within the last, what, three years, he had passed away from a car accident. Right. And, and um, just a really tragic end to his life. Uh, he, he really did have a history of just poor decision making and and just kind of erratic behavior, really, which which made him a very easy target for the documentary Paradise Lost 1. And Correct. And somehow, some way, and I don't know why, and, and, you know, we will never be able to really ask, ask him why, but he sort of kind of embraced this character. I don't know why he did, but I mean, he was very, very animated 
during while, while the cameras were following him around. Would you agree with that? Well, he, he of course he was a big dude. Yes, he was six foot eight and a half, and that's a big man. Yes. So the bigger they are, the louder they yell or speak, whatever. Right. But yeah, he put in the show for the cameras, and you know, if, if it was like if they'd done him like they'd done Pam. Now they told Pam, if you will come over and help us get these boys out of prison, uh, we're going to sue the state. And they threw a $100 million lawsuit number out at her and told her she would get some of that money. So Pam just jumped on there and just, you know, her and her family or some of her sisters just took off on the Terry wagon. Right, right. You know, and and, what, and I'm, I'm not sure if they got to Mark and told him that, but something they done something to him to get him to do what he's done. And he's put on a show for everybody. And that had to feel like a betrayal, really. Because, I mean, you guys were really all in this together against the accused and, and convicted child killers, Damien, Jesse, and Jason. And it really did feel like John Mark Byers really took the opportunity, especially years later, to really join up with the actual witch hunt of this, you know, when they went after you, which hasn't stopped. But sometimes I feel like maybe the reason that he did that is to get some of the some of it off of him. Well, I feel like that too. Uh, yeah, you know, it doesn't it doesn't change anything about the trials and all this, but it just you know to me, you know, it's, there was no sense in it. There was no reason for it. And it's just more showtime than anything. So one of the things he that put on, it, oh he put on a show, and, he did, and that wasn't obviously that really wasn't your cup of tea. You you have never been loud and boisterous, and and a lot of that, by the way, is probably why a lot of people have targeted you. But and we'll get into the reasons why that you you've been targeted, uh, in my opinion, unfairly, very unfairly. Uh, almost to the fact of, I mean, this, you know, it's, it's affected your life in a major way, not only losing Stevie and, and subsequently your family really started to fall apart after that. Correct. Of course. Yeah. The loss itself is devastating. It's a tragic and there's nothing you can do about that. So as you struggle, this is what we've done as we struggle to deal with this, to reason with this, you know, it was it was bigger than we were, and it, so it started working on the home. You know, and it started working on each individual different ways. You know, when the mind takes off in a rant that you, that it's out of control, and things go through the mind that you know you never think of or never thought of, well, it, it starts affecting the way you live. You you know, you act, you move, you're, it, it'll, it affects your whole being, you know, and then, you, then you're then you searching for purpose, you know, and what is my purpose in this, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that people uh, just don't really realize uh, what goes on with families that deal with something like this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's devastating to say the least. One of the things that was always brought up is that there was that the three convicted killers were targeted? Their names were picked out of a hat because they were weird, because they liked Metallica, because you know Damien was odd, and to me, Damien was the ringleader of the the three boys and and of all three of them, and he had a serious, serious history uh, with mental health, violence, um, satanic rituals, odd religions, and um, just really, really terrible behavior. All And he was only a 17-year-old boy at the time, close to 18. When you first heard about the three boys, how shocking, at the time, boys, teenagers how shocking was it oh it was devastating when we showed up in court we got a call to come to court on the morning that they were gonna arraign them and 
where we showed up and there was this three wild looking teenager boys, you know, in, in handcuffs and they had a wall of officers in front of them protecting them. And of course, you know, we didn't know what to think. Well, did they look any different you know, than any other teenagers around that area? Well, they had long hair, you know, uh, from what I heard, Damien dressed in black, and I don't know how none of them dressed. You know, I've just seen pictures of them, you know, how they dressed before, but I didn't know nothing about them. The Damien in the in the black, you know, he wore a, it was like a trench coat. He used to walk around uh town in the trench coat like at all hours at all hours of the day and night um that was kind of his thing and and he the satanic panic thing kind of starts to come in you know paradise lost shows up they're they're recording they're they're talking about this case and in fact the reason that damien was looked at was because of his probation officer his probation officer uh alerted the police they said you might want to take a look at this kid you know he's got a he's got a history of mental health and and you know you you definitely need to look at him because before that they had went through all sorts of stuff they went through trucking logs fuel logs to see who had been through the area Uh, the fbi was in handing out flyers and uh, questionnaires and damien filled out his questionnaire and he was did it in such a stupid way that made him look guilty really uh, or suspicious at least. So that's when they end up hauling in Jesse, Miss Kelly, but Jesse wasn't a suspect at the time. They just thought he was, they just knew that he was friends with Damien. And so they wanted to talk to him. And then he ends up kind of implicating himself in the crimes in the, and then he implicates Jason and, and Damien as well. He fails a lie detector uh, I believe Damien fails a lie detector. Jason refuses to take a lie detector. And anyway, after all that happened, they're arrested. They go to trial, two separate trials, both found guilty, so on and so forth. Fast forward to Paradise Lost 2. Now, this, to me, is where they really started to focus on John Mark Byers because right. his behavior had become even more erratic. He was an easy target. And Marl Everett, and I'm sure you're familiar with her. I am really pushed this narrative of the innocence of Jesse Miss Kelly, Damian Eccles, and Jason Baldwin for whatever reason. But how did you feel after you saw Paradise Lost 2? Yeah, because they asked us if we would uh, be a part of Paradise Lost 2, and we told them no. You know, we was kind of through with them after the first one. And so we, we declined the second one, and then... You know, they he uh, I believe it was Joe Berlinger who yep. told us that well, Mark would do it. We'd just give him a thousand bucks. He'll get out there and put a show on, and he did. You know, and and uh, that's Mark. You know, everybody got to see a side of Mark they probably didn't know, and but he put on a good show. And I had a lot of investigators who took that second documentary. And would reach out to me and say, this man is making himself look suspicious, you know, and which I, I didn't think he looked suspicious. I thought he looked more goofy than anything, but he, you know, this is how, the, uh, this is how people perceived him, you know, is making himself look suspicious. And all this was probably because, you know, he gave one of them guys a pocket knife that had some blood on it back during the first documentary mm-hmm. in the, in the trials. And this is probably what caused that. And, of course, you know, you could see there was some hurt in him. You could see that. And he was just lashing out, you know, shooting his gun and doing whatever. And But that's just Mark. How well did you get to know Mark after that, the murders and the trial? And did you guys stay in touch after that? Uh, I worked for Mark for a little while, helped him do some things that he needed done. And, you know, thought I knew him, but the whole time, I guess I was, you know, uh, one of his uh, being a targeted and I didn't really catch on to that at first, 
But, you know, there was a lot of things transpired after that that kind of led me to believe that, you know, Mark is not not acting right. And, and I had to put some distance between us. Do you think any of that was drug or alcohol related? Did you notice any drinking or drug use or anything like that? Well, I did. I did. And, of course, I wasn't a drinker. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a druggie. And, but I'd, I'd, I'd go out there and I'd see some things that, you know, wouldn't me. And I didn't partake of some of the things I've seen. I would not have smoked the joint. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but, uh, no, I didn't partake of the other things. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and that could be attributed to the, the, the behavior. Cause he lost his, he lost his wife, um, just not too long after, uh, paradise lost one came out. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. He moved out of West Memphis and he moved up, up here in the Ozark mountains where we are close to where we are and lived a different life when, once he got up here. What do you mean a different life? Just like a cleaner life, a quieter life? Oh no. <laughs> a worse life. Yeah. 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 He was breaking in people's homes. This was all documented. They've got all this at least departments over there where he lived and with breaking in people's homes, stealing their stuff, taking it to local auctions and selling it back to them. And that's how, that's how, that's how he got busted about it. Cause people seen their stuff for sale and they got the police involved. So, well, he had had that happen before. Uh, he had been convicted of, of stealing and ro- robbing even, a few different times, but I got a good story to tell you yeah. about when he left West Memphis, he had a moving sale. Okay. So we, I've never been in his house. So we, me and Pam go to the moving sale and we buy some things. And when, when you walk in, all you see is antiques and it looked, it looked sharp, you know, walking in, seeing all these different antiques and, so we buy some. So, and we take them home. And a few days later, I get a knock on my door, and it's a detective, West Memphis detective. And he asked me if I went to March moving sale. I said, Sure, we bought some things. I told him what we bought. He said, Would you mind hanging on to them? I said, Well, I bought them. I'm going to keep them. He said, No, he said, They could be stolen. I said, well, if they're stolen, I don't want them. You can have them. Right. <laughs> he said, I don't want them. You hang on to them. You bought them. Right. <laughs> so right. I did. I hung on to them for years, and, uh, and I still got, you know, a few things from there. And he told me, or Courtney, I, he never did come back after that and tell me that they was actually stolen. I never heard from him again about that. Wow, <clears throat> so I don't know if they was or not. But. Well, it wouldn't surprise. I mean, he had he had been in trouble for that kind of stuff. So you know, it may, that makes sense. Um, yeah, know, that happened. Very troubled, very troubled, and he. I believe he died in uh, what was it, uh, twenty twenty. He, he had a in a car crash. It was. I don't know if he stole the vehicle or what it was, but it he wasn't supposed to be driving the vehicle. He didn't have his oxygen tank with him. He was driving erratic on those back roads and he crashed and died and, and which was a very chaotic ending to a very chaotic life, you know, unfortunately. Correct. Um, and it's sad to see it play out like that, but that's just how it ended. Yeah. Some people call it karma and some, you know, some people just call it that's the way it is. So yeah. One of the things that people cue in on you on is, they, they always, they want to talk about your quote unquote alibi, you know, how good your alibi or what do you say to people that question your alibi? I got the best alibi out of anybody. Yeah. And people, they don't believe that, but here's one, here's a good alibi. And it is, if it's, if they kept the, uh, if they kept the tapes down at the police station, they could see where me Pam, her dad and mom, and David Jacoby went to the police department 
about three times that night. And sat in there in front of uh, office. You stand there in front of video cameras. Now, if they if they kept these tapes as uh, evidence, that is the best alibi anybody can have. You had been in and out of the police station that night about three different times. Yes, sir. In between looking or looking for the boys as well, correct? Correct. Right. We ride around, walk around out in the woods, ride around town looking and go to the police department and ask them if y'all heard anything about the boys. And they tell us, no, go on home. When we find them, we'll bring them home. Well, well, we just couldn't do that. So we'd leave to go out and do what we did again. Look around, ride around, walk around, go back to the police department. The third time we went down there, they told us, don't you guys come back. Because you're kind of harassing us and, you know, we'll arrest you. Right. So we took that and left and went on about our business and, and kept on looking and walking and riding around looking for them. But if they kept them tapes, you know, that is an undisputed alibi. Well, the thing is, too, they, meaning investigators, didn't question your alibi. That wasn't, it, it, it's it, it's the internet sleuths. It's the people that watch the documentaries and take them as, as law. They take them as fact. Um, those are the people that question your alibi. No, not law enforcement. So that is, that is something that really needs to be um, distinguished because uh, look, they looked at everybody, including parents. Right. I still have the article. I don't know if I sent it to you where in 2007, when they, you know, launched this campaign against me, I've got the article out of the commercial film newspaper where the police department uh, tells in this article that Terry was not a suspect in 93 and he is not a suspect in 07. And the 07 is when that the the hair on one of the, the ligatures was found, correct? Correct. You know, so they think they, they don't want to talk about all the other evidence. I don't know what all kind of evidence is there. I never have looked, but that is the only piece that the defense is harping on and has for years. So what it is, is it's, it's, it's called mitochondrial DNA and it's a hair. It's like a rootless hair that can be traced through like lineage. But the problem is it, it fit dozens of people in that town. It, you know, it, it fit dozens of profile in that town and uh, millions in the United States. The main issue with that is if your hair was in one of the ligatures and we're not even sure that it was yours, nobody's even positive that it's yours. It would make Correct. sense if there was a hair there since the boys were at your house that day and one of the boys lived with you because he was your stepson. Right. It's called secondary transfers, what I've been told over the years. But, you know, and that's never bothered me. You know, I would expect something of mine to be there, you know, because of Stevie. And if there is, I'm not worried, never have been bothered by that. And if there's not, I'm still not bothered by that. The FBI wasn't bothered by it either. You do have an alibi. And that's that's all been established. But I'll tell you who doesn't have an alibi. Jesse Miss Kelly. Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin. Not one of them. Not one alibi was presented worth a damn at trial. And I think Damian, that was one of Damian's things that my, my lawyers never brought up my alibis. And the reason they didn't bring them up is because they were disproven by, by the girls. He was supposed to be on the phone with these girls, these certain, I don't know, whoever these girls were, but the fact of the matter is they couldn't be accounted for from about five to about nine thirty that night. My question is to you, when you were looking, how close to Robin Hood Hills were you guys? Yeah, we was right out there in the middle of it. You know, it was so growed up and all you could do was walk down a path. And so we was walking down the path. You know, we didn't know where the path went. We just walking down them. But we you know, the path would go around Robin Hood. I mean, the actual ditch where they were found. So there was a lot of runoffs, ditches there. And we would, we didn't know what was out there. And that was our first time ever be out there if it was at night. And 
But I think there was a time when I, me, David, Jacoby, and Pam's dad was walking down a path. I seen a path cut off one way, and I told them guys, I said, I'm going to go this way, check this out. And so they said, sure. So I go down through there, and I ain't kidding you. I bet you that was the path that led to that ditch that they were found in. Because the farther I went down that path, the more the more evil spirit or seem, seemed like something was out there that just stopped me, wouldn't let me go any further. And I, I just couldn't believe that. I turned around and walked back where I came from. But I've, I've wondered all these years if that was the actual path that went, led to that ditch where them boys were found. Can you, but can, we was close. That whole night we was out there and we was close and didn't even know it. Can you tell me who David Jacoby is? Well, I met David Jacoby through Pam. He was from Blyville. That's where Pam was from. And they grew up and went to school together and all that. And I met him in West Memphis. And he was a steel worker and uh, built, you know, big buildings out of steel. And that's how I met him. And I kind of felt like, you know, he's pretty good, pretty good guy. So, you know, I gave him a guitar one time and showed him how to make a few chords and he could learn how to play it. And we played guitars from time to time. And, but, you know, I got him a job where I worked at one time because he was between, you know, his work, construction. And so, you know, I, I just liked David. He seemed like a pretty level-headed dude until Was that the ice cream happened. company? It was. Okay. He actually worked with me at the ice cream company. Uh-huh. And, but when, when this happened in 93, something, fear, intimidation, I know, uh, that John Douglas and his bunch intimidated him and put fear in him and he got scared and just did anything they wanted him to do. He did it. Do, do you know if they pa- think, paid him or not? I don't know that for sure. Yeah. No. You have your suspicion, uh, but I couldn't say. Right. I think today he regrets that. And I've heard, heard some few people talk about him over the past few years and how he regrets, you know, talking to Bob Ruff and putting on the show he did on the channel. And, uh, you know, I think he's regretted some of the things that happened. Yeah. Because you guys didn't have, you didn't have any, you didn't have a bad relationship. I mean, matter of fact, like you went to pick him up, he was helping you guys look for the kids, correct? He was. Yeah. Yeah. And matter of fact, he was with us most of the night and actually he was still working at the ice cream company. Because that toward the early morning hours, I, I went to him or I told him, I said, David, yeah, I guess you could go to work, you know, we'll keep on looking. And he went to work and told my boss, you know, what was going on. But David, to me, was a good man, and he probably still is, and he probably lives with a few regrets. What was the last time you spoke with David? Oh, it's been 20 years or better. That's quite some time. Yeah, it's it's sad to see what cases like this does to people. And, but I almost, you can almost say, I think we've seen it all. <laughs> Darn near close. And as, as the 30th anniversary of the murders of Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers and Michael Moore approach, it's amazing that we're still talking about this HBO max which is an app on your phone or your streaming device, really started getting rolled out overseas in the last few years with COVID coming in and everything. And Paradise Lost is an HBO exclusive, the trilogy, along with the, the, I don't know about The Devil's Knot. I I, I don't even think I've ever seen that movie with the Reese Witherspoon that played Pam. Or I, I never saw it. Um. Cause all I knew was that Damien was like, got an executive producer role on it. And I, I just was like, I, I'm not, I don't really fancy him making money off of, off this case, which is what he's done for years and is still trying to continue to do by asking for just certain little pieces of evidence to be retested. Um, fact of the matter is the case is closed uh, they they don't owe him anything. He's got his freedom. He just doesn't like walking around with the tag of uh, triple triple child killer and convicted because well, 
he shouldn't have done it then. Well, and I don't disagree with you there. But, you know, like even even in the Arkansas Times, right? I read this thing in the Arkansas Times was it, and it was when it was when John Mark passed away. Basically says when they were talking about it, it says he was the stepfather of Christopher Byers, one of the three children killed in 1993 in the case that sent three men to prison, ultimately freed after a long campaign that they had been wrongfully convicted. And that's not true. They they weren't released because they were wrongfully convicted. That's not why they were released. They were released because um, of, of the Alford plea. And, and, and I'm sure you guys had to deal with that quite a bit. How shocked were you when they made that deal? Well, we didn't know they made that deal. You know, I get my phone call the night before uh, the release, and I'm arguing with the, uh, the new district attorney about no you don't release them and that's my stand and and he tells me why and his reason being that you know the, the look what some of the family's members have done and some of the witnesses from 93 have died and you know they drug us in and out of court for the last 18 years and you know I'm taking the stand, and I had the state behind me saying that we're part of this case, and we will go make them plead guilty and release them. And that was devastating. I was at the release when it happened, and I just couldn't believe what we were saying. But, you know, there's, there's times when it doesn't matter what you think or say, that especially when you're up against state and, you know, different things like that, that they're going to do what they're going to do. Well, they got they got the guilty. Uh, they got them signed guilty, and that was all they wanted. When, I believe the Alfred plea goes on to say that they still, there's still enough evidence and to, you know, convict on a retrial. So, I, and, I, and I wondered, you know, why didn't you use that evidence then to keep them in prison? But they claimed that they were the state was just tired of it, you know, being drug in and out of court on appeals. But that's part of the job. It's, it certainly and is. We kind of, yeah, we kind of felt like we had a new DA that didn't want to do the job. And, and this, is Scott, this is Scott Ellington that we're talking about, the district attorney at the time in, in West Memphis. And he no, was he, kind of grandfathered into this, correct? Yeah, he was in Jonesboro. That's where the DA's office was, Jonesboro, gotcha. Arkansas. Gotcha. Yeah, and he was kind of grandfathered into it. You know, and I think at the time, you know, remember they had sent, I think, 15 pieces of evidence off to be tested at the time. And when, I'm thinking they came back. And the defense didn't like what they seen, so they, you know, approached the state with this Alfred plea and got them to sign guilt. And it was very important what you just said there. You said the defense approached the state for the Alfred plea. It wasn't the other way around, correct? Correct. Yes. That's another misconception is that people say that the state offered the Alfred plea. The defense's lawyers, specifically Damien's, because... Damien was actually fighting for his life because he was set to be executed at some point because he received the death penalty. As we go along here, people would like to say that he was that that they offered them the Alfred plea and it was just the other way around. They were actually offered a new evidentiary hearing in the case, which could determine whether or not they got a new trial or when they brought they said, well, what about then the defense says, well, what about the Alfred plea? And they said, okay, well, which one you want to do? And they took the Alfred plea right. because they, they didn't want to go uh, on trial again. Right, because they would have been found guilty again, in and, my opinion. And, and by the way, if I was Damien, Jason, or Jesse, specifically Damien, I would have taken that deal too. Who wouldn't? Well, they they said they took it the end. You know, they was ready to get out of prison, which who wouldn't be? Exactly. And I probably would have took it. I probably would have took it too. Yep, I would have too. But the problem is, what they said was when they were doing this that they were ready to find the. They could find the real killers now that they were free. That was a that was a big thing. Uh, have they done anything? Did Did you know that of anything that they had done other than trying to, quote unquote, clear their name, which still to this day, almost thirty years later 
hasn't happened. Were you aware of any efforts to try and find, in their their words, the real killers or killer? But I've known of some things that they've done. <laughs> I think they put, well, I don't think, I know they, they put an article out one time where they found this is what some of the games that they play. They, you know, they have targeted me. Uh, Damien Eccles and his whole bunch have targeted me. And so when I see this, well, I know that they they haven't kept not one bit of their words by saying that we'll, we can find them easier on the outside than we can on the inside. Okay? So wh- when they threw my name out there, I knew this was all wrong. But again, that's what they do. All right? They went to, they put an article out where they, found one of my one of my trucks that I uh, had at the time. I used to buy old pickup trucks and restore them and sell them. Okay, and I had one at the time of 93. And I sold it to a man, and he still got it today. A 66 uh, Chevrolet uh, pickup truck. Man, it's cool looking. Okay, but they put out, they found this truck, and they went and found some blood in the truck. This is what they done, the Eccles bunch. And they and said it was uh, dried up, couldn't be tested and all that kind of stuff. So, and I didn't believe that when I seen it. It went all across the news. And so I go to the man's home, and I'm still friends with him today, that bought this truck, and I asked him, I said, have these guys, he said, I've seen that on the news, Terry. He said, that is the biggest lie I've ever seen. And he said, well, I asked him, I said, did they come out here? He said, they have not. And so, and I didn't believe it when I heard it, but this is the kind of thing that they claim that they're, you know, doing to find the real killers. Mm. Right. How come they can't stand in front of the mirror and look at the mirror and say, I found it? Jesse Miss Kelly, whose father has just passed away recently within the last year and a half. I'm under the impression that he still lives in West Memphis, Arkansas and lives in poverty may have substance abuse issues, specifically alcohol. And that he has actually been arrested a couple times. I think they're driving without a license, thing like that. Things that could have sent him back to prison. Okay. That didn't somehow, some way, but he lives, he basically lives in squalor. Okay. He's, he's just, you know, his life, isn't isn't good and but the one thing that i will say about jesse is that he seemed like he was the only one that had a conscience out of the out of the three because of all those confessions it was like he couldn't i mean he's he was confessing terry after they had convicted him i know and he was like i and and his lawyer stidham you remember mr stidham who's now somehow a judge which is beyond me um I'll never forget on Paradise Lost when he stood up there in front of the jury. He says, "What what Jesse Miss Kelly gave you in like in big letters?" He goes, "Was a false confession." And I'm going, "This is your opening statement." He's like pointing at the words "false confession." I'm going, "Okay, well, this is that that didn't go well for him, obviously." But Stidham would basically in '94 begged Jesse not to give an on the record confession. And he said, I've got new evidence, Jesse. Do you remember that? He said, yeah, that's what she said. Jesse, don't do this. And he says, Jesse, if you're going to do this, you better put your hand on this Bible and, and you'd give this confession against my will, but put your hand on this Bible. And what does he do? He puts his hand on the Bible and confesses again. Yeah. Eight times, I believe. It was, it was close to eight different full confessions and right. many other partials. Maybe it was seven. I can't remember, but it was up there. It was, it was getting near double digits, but he had also done a bunch of partial confessions, meaning like he told parts of the stories to others, but on the record confessions, you have at least seven, possibly eight. One of them was right after he was convicted and being driven back to jail that day by two police officers that were transporting him back to jail. Right. I remember that. And, you know, so when I say, when I say he's the only one with a conscience, I do believe that obviously I feel he's just as culpable as any of them. He chased poor little Michael Moore down 
beat the hell out of him. I don't know exactly what he had to do with the, you know, the mutilation and things like that. Um, but you know, they're, they're all guilty, but I do know that he was the only one that couldn't keep it all inside. And, um, you know, now he lives a, a very, a, a very troubled life. And, and a lot of that is, most of that is because of his own behavior. So he's, he, he's, he lives poor. Jason, who I've had like very little contact with, you know, he's, he's not, he doesn't really do interviews with people who oppose only people that are like for him. And he knows, he knows who I am. Damien definitely knows who I am. And that guy hates me. Jason basically lives in a trailer, uh, like a mobile trailer. He's, he's poor as well and, and has nothing to do uh, with Jesse or Damien. They're not friends or anything anymore. And then you have Damien who probably makes somewhere around 10,000 bucks a month through his little fan funding page. He sells death coffee. Uh, it's a, it's a brand of coffee. He lives in new Orleans. He, he does his little voodoo black magic still is that he's in, he's still into Aleister Crowley all these years later. It's, it's almost a mockery because when he was in jail, you know, he was like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm for Jesus Christ. I'm a, I'm a, this, I'm a, that, totally played off his whole satanic fascinations okay and he t- he's still doing them today i don't know if you're aware of that well i do i i've seen something on uh, youtube not long ago where you know these people still you know they they're just feeding him to the place where you know, they believe everything he says and you know, it, it, to me, that's the, the way that they that that he is out here. You know, getting money out of people. You know, I, I googled his name one time, and I believe it said he was worth a half million dollars since since he's been released. Probably so. Maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe more. I believe a guy that we know mutually. His name's Paul. He's an Australian fella very into the case, you know, and he, he's a, he's a nice friend. And, and he came up with a, he told me a very interesting thought. If somebody had railroaded me and, and put me in jail or prison by giving a false confession, I would s- scream that person's name from the top of the rooftops, call him a liar. How could you do this to us? So on and so forth. I wouldn't be understanding. I wouldn't be forgiving. And the reason that they aren't is because they don't want him. To. Of course, <laughs> but and, so, a whole bunch. and so Paul's theory, which I agree with, is the reason that they don't is it you don't want to you don't want to rock the boat. You know, you, you you got what you want. You're out of jail. You won't say anything bad about him. But they don't like Damien, and they they don't like him. Um, I could argue with you that Wait, Jesse you- never liked him. If you can remember uh, when they had this last hearing in West Memphis where the judge denied the testing of the evidence, Jason showed up. And he had made the statement that he didn't even know this was going on. Correct. So that's how yeah, that's how much contact they keep with each other. And Jesse didn't show up at all. Right. He's kind of just given not giving up on it, but you know, he just, he doesn't really care, uh, to, he's not making any money off of this, which I guess is commendable in some way, but he doesn't care to, he doesn't want to talk about it. Um, Damien right. on the other hand has embraced it and turned it into a cash cow, the murders of these three little boys and, and how, how that was ever allowed. I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. He, you know, he writes all these books and these stupid magic books and he he gets a lot of um he gets he gets a lot of backing um not so much anymore like you know he's you know they're pushing 50 now and while the there is still support for damien specifically uh, it's definitely not what it was and so that's why he keeps coming out with oh we have new evidence so it's uh, such and such blah 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 but so when the whole time they don't. N- no, they never have. They never will. 
you know, I remember I was, you, you know, you're familiar with Gary Meese, Gary, a friend of mine, and and we've done work together on this case. And he says if they're if they can come up with any evidence pointing to their innocence, like if they can prove that they're innocent, he goes, I'll take down everything I've ever written, podcast about them. I'll take it all down and I'll apologize. And I, I doubled down. I said, I'd do the same thing. But the problem is that's never going to happen because they just can't do it. You know, there were lawyers and the supporters of the three that say that they're still pushing for a full exoneration. You know, they had an, an, an anonymous donor who offered two hundred, who offered a $200,000 reward for new information that led to the arrest and conviction the, of the 1993 murders of, of the three little boys. Right. Nobody's ever paid that out. Because no, it started. It started at a hundred. They didn't get nowhere with that. A hundred thousand. Yep. They didn't get nowhere with that. And it went up to two hundred thousand, and, it, and it's still, you know, it, it it was shot down. Because, well, they they just there's, not, there's nothing there, right? Right. There's nothing there. Never so. has been. I Never. guess this is a a game that that the defense plays. You know, and I've asked. I don't know how many times when it's going to end, and I keep getting told it may never end. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with um, Michael Moore's father? Well, uh, I met him at also. I met him at the Cub Scouts uh, thing where he was the you know one of the Cub Scout leaders, and that's how I first met Todd. And then I didn't really meet him in anymore until after May the 5th. And so, you know, we talked a few times until he moved away. And I haven't spoke to him since he's moved away. Yeah. So really, we, we didn't have a relationship. You know, he was like, he was like we were. We was mad at the time when we met because we were, you know, drug into something that was out of our control and we had no control of. So, you know, there was just a lot of anger with everybody. And I kind of seen, you know, like we don't need to be hanging around this man because <laughs> <laughs> he was just as mad as we was. Seriously. He seemed like a good guy. Sure. The times I did talk to him, I'd go, I'd been over his uh, place before and, you know, seemed like a pretty good guy, but I just didn't hang around. And then they used to say things like the, that you were a butcher. Do you, have you heard that one? Uh, I've heard it, sure. Were you ever a butcher? Well, back in the 70s, we lived in a little town called Cave City, Arkansas. And my dad, uh, coming out of the Air Force, when he came out of the Air Force, he came out as a German meat cutter. Okay, so he stayed around meat. So in the 70s, he decided, Let, let's just build a packing house, a processing plant in Cave City. So he built one. Okay. It was family owned and it was family run. We we run that uh, packing house from the back to the front. And sure, I did my share of uh, processing beef, poultry, uh Pigs, hogs, anything, and wild game, anything that the hunters would bring in, we would process it. Anything the farmers would bring in, we'd process it for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Pretty standard stuff. I mean, yeah, one doesn't have to do with the other, but that was also one of the, see these really flimsy, weird theories. Um, but here's the thing. The, the people that support Damien, Jason, and Jesse, they overlook the fact that Damien was spotted on the service road about 930 that night with, they didn't know if it was Dominie, his girlfriend or Jason. They were both built similar and had similar hair covered in mud, wet, walking probably close to about 200 feet from where the boys were actually found. Right. And it was wet. They were wet and muddy. The supporters don't talk about that. And they, and they say, well, that was recanted. It wasn't recanted by there was a group of there was a group of five in a station wagon who knew damien very well i believe they might have even been related uh, two of them testified in court yeah that was him 
on the service road, just a few hundred feet from where the boys were found brutally murdered. Then you have a confession by Jesse, and then you had Michael Carson in court testify against Jason that he confessed to him in jail. Now, I will agree that it's never, you know, a jailhouse confession or a, a snitch type situation isn't always that reliable or credible but here's the thing michael carson received nothing no compensation no time off no anything for testifying he never recanted it either he said he regrets getting involved he doesn't recant what he said he just regrets getting involved one of the major things that the west memphis three supporters like to say is that was recanted the softball girls recanted this person recanted jesse recanted uh, Michael Carson was the one that was in jail with Jason and Jason told him okay. what they had done with the boys. So then he testified at trial as well against Jason as a confession. And the jury thought that bas that was basically what brought Jason down that, that confession. They believed Michael Carson. They, he knew things about the murders that was, that was told by Jason and that he was going to, he was going to kill a couple more kids. And the, the, right. the little I'm girls dead. at the softball game heard him say that. And they got on the stand and told, right. Nobody talks about that. They want to talk about a hair. They want to talk about your hair. Yeah. And I get people all the time that still beat me up with that hair. And it's never been proven it's mine. It just could have been. And even you know, if it was yours, it wouldn't know. matter. Right. It's like Ron Lax told me. And Ron Lax is one of the biggest reasons that this all got started with my name. He told me, he said, Hobbs, I'm going to sick the dogs on you. And ever since he said that, it's been one dog after another. And then once it made it to the social media, then every dog would come out of the woodworks that you could imagine. What has that done to you, you know, psychologically or even physically, ha having to defend your name after your stepson, who I believe, weren't you really the only father that he had? Yeah. Uh, yes, I was. And, uh, he loved me just like I loved him, and he didn't really know his first dad, but his dad loved him. He just... It was a situation that where the grandparents wasn't going to let him see his son. And that's how that all went down. But what this has done to me, this has beat me up for 30 years until, or I ain't going to say 30, let's say 20, until I went to an altar and full of anger. And I had to lay it at the altar and leave it there so I could live. But prior to that, uh, I was just beating myself up with these people and what they was doing to me and saying about me. And it caused me lots of problems. And matter of fact, I'm working on a book, my second book. And this book is going to be about what this has done to me. And it's really going to be uh, a shock to people to see what people go through to see, you know, after something like this. And, but I can't help, you know, what people go through. I just, I know what I've lived with and had to put up with for the last 30 years. And, it's really, it's really sad to see that, you know, things are allowed to happen and it's just like you don't have a right at all, a victim. And, and I'm sure there's, and I see some of these other cases going where victims, the family members are the bad people. Well, every case is not built like that, but every case is perceived like that. You know, and uh, we're one of the cases that, you know, even though they judge us like they do, uh, doesn't make us fit that judgment. You know, and it's sad because people do go out here and kill their own kids. And every case, in most cases, they look at us, too, as parents. And then social media gets a hold of it, and they just, you know, run with it. 
and could care less what it does to people. I still get my threats. I still get hate mails like you wouldn't believe. And I get all kind of things that's just uncalled for. And so as I'm working on this other book, it's really going to be shocking to see, you know, what I went through. And I can only imagine what the other families have gone through. Do you mind if I ask you, Pam, at all? Sure, go ahead. So I recently saw that she was arrested really recently, like within the last month or so. You know, I saw her mug shot and she just, she looks really, really beat down by life. And what was the last time you you had a conversation with Pam? Oh, it's been a long time. I don't talk to Pam. And my daughter, Amanda, is over there with her. Now, if I'm talking to Amanda, sometimes Pam will be in the background and if she finds out it's me, she'll have something to say. Mm. And it's not bad. It's just, you know, sometimes she'll cuss me. That's just Pam. Mm-hmm. And sometimes she'll just say something. But no, I don't talk to her. And she has. She got arrested uh, several times. Actually, y'all don't really know. But uh, it's, and, and I know, uh, it's just eats her up about what happened to Stevie. I understand that. And it has all of us. And then again, she has another side that's just beating her up with what she has done about all of this. And, you know, she, she's called back when I did talk to Pam after she'd get out here and say something on the news. I'd call her and say, why'd you do that? She'd apologize and cry about it. You know, people don't know that and probably don't believe it, but it did happen. And but I've seen, uh, I've seen things out of Pam that's just unbelievable. Well, I I have it and, on good authority that she was paid some money as well by people. Well, I wouldn't doubt it. I know the Bob Ruff. Probably, I think he'd give her money mm-hmm. to get on there, her and her sister, and to do that. But yeah, I could only imagine. Yep. And then the Reese Witherspoon Devil's Not movie. I think they give her some money and took her to the Grammys that that one time. Well, just like my daughter, they have taken advantage of her. Uh, who was it? Oh, they made a doctor west of Memphis. Yeah, yeah. There was so. I mean, if you if you don't mind, uh, they got her to accuse you of things that were never exactly. proven and that she took back, correct? Correct. And she come to me afterwards and apologized, asked Dad to forgive her, and I asked her why she done it. She said, Dad, I done it for the money, for the habit. They was giving me money and taking me to the dope man's house and, you know, giving the dope man money and taking me out and getting me drugged up and I and getting me to say anything. Which doesn't justify it, but it happened. Did you forgive her? As a parent, you, of course you do. How's your I relationship with her girl. now? I was at the top of the world. Good. <laughs> I'm really. I'm, That's my. I'm glad to hear that, Terry. I really am, because that was really but, weaponized against you as well. They said, "Well, you know, even if he didn't do that, he, you know, there was sexual misconduct between, you know, his daughter, and that was the alleged." You know, that's what she had said. But then she had also said that she made it up. She lied about it for for the money and the and the drugs. I mean, that is what happened. Right. Solid together. Um, she obviously believes that you had nothing to do with the murders of the three little boys. I mean, she obviously believes all those things. Well, of course, she knows. She knows. Sure. The truth, but sure. He, he was with me, you know, a lot that night until I dropped her off at David's house picked him up. Did you have anything to do with this? The murders of the three of little course, boys? Of course not. No, I, at the time of 93, and it's like it was 30 years after, I've been a working dad, took care of my family. Yes. We had a, we had a life in West Memphis that was, you know, that we enjoyed, that we loved, that all of us, we as being the family, it's the best life Pam ever had and it was, it was a life that I was used to having 
and we lived because dad was always the one that kept it going. And I didn't go around hurting my kids, hurting my family. And I took care of my family. Do you believe that Damien, Jesse, and Jason are guilty? I believe it with all of my heart. And if I thought otherwise, the whole world would know it. In other words, you wouldn't stand for three, at the time, teenage boys, almost young men, being railroaded. You wouldn't stand for that either. No, sir. I believe the police department, West Memphis Police Department, put their heart into it. And especially when we're sitting there talking to them in 93, and you see them men, tears come to their eyes because they're having to ask questions, you know, and and they just got to see things that we never got to see in this case. And and then talking about the boys being pulled out of the waters, you know, we didn't see all that, but they did. And when they sit there and talk to you and they see the hurt on us, And you could see the hurt in them by asking the questions that they asked us. You know, I've actually seen tears come to their eyes. You know, and and if if I saw anything different than them boys being guilty, I would tell the whole world about it. And to this day, their conviction is upheld. It gives this, it kind of gives this, since they're out, this impression that they, they were exonerated. And that's just not true either. I know. I know anything they say, people believe it, you know, and and that just gets me sometimes, but that's just the way it is. Did you notice Damien's antics at, in court? Did you see any of that? Yeah. I said, I said every day in the courtroom, two trials and, uh, Jesse wouldn't raise his head during his trial. I remember Jason tried to keep his head down much as he could and Damien would sit there and blow kisses at you and wink at you and smile at you. Did he do that to you specifically? I don't know if it was to me because we all we all sat together It was was to the victim's family. Right. It was in our direction. Didn't he flip the bird to you guys as well? He did. I mean, it, and it was at the time. It's just like he was sitting there for show, just like he was enjoying it. I think he thought that he was. They were going to be found uh, not guilty, um, but you know, when you don't have alibis, how's that going to happen? I mean, the, and the, the evidence against them uh, was substantial. Terry, it just comes back really to that hair. That's when it exploded. Paradise lost three, the same way that Paradise lost two went against John Mark. It didn't work with John Mark, so then they went after you. It was anybody else besides the three that had the evidence against them that were convicted by a jury of 12 twice. And might I add, the confession, and even if people say, well, the confession was coarse, by no means was Jesse mentally retarded. He may have not been smart, but, I mean, that's very insulting to even insinuate. I mean, he may be simple, but he's not, you know, retarded. I never believed that. I didn't know him, but, you know, I, he just didn't look retarded to me. That's right. what Stidham came up with for defense, because how else are you going to defend somebody that's confessed the way that he's confessed? You have to say it's a it's it's a coerced confession, and that was right. what they went with. But Jesse, some way, somehow, some reason, decided not to testify, which was another oddity in this, but... You can't, you can't explain Jesse to anybody. So the, the, the confession wasn't even used in the trial of Jason and Damien. They were convicted on witness statements and, and their own statements and, and um, also um, eyewitness, uh, eyewitness statements and, and so on and so forth. That's what they were convicted on. Je- Jesse was convicted on his statements. Damien and and Jason were convicted on uh, the evidence with, and the confession wasn't even allowed in. That's how strong of a case it was. I know. I know. But, you know, try to get the public to believe that, you know, and they don't. Some do. You know, a lot of them, they say, well, I see, I see 
my Damien, you know, I was just like Damien. Well, if that's true, then you bashed the heads of dogs in, cut them open and wore their intestines. You killed right. cats. You, you kept their skulls. You wore them around your neck. That would mean you filed your fingernails to a point and tried to gouge people's eyes out. That would mean you had tried to set a school on fire. And that would mean that you would have a 500 page mental health history report by the time you were 17 years old where you had been admitted to at least two mental institutions against your will by your parents for threatening to kill them. Nobody talks about that. I know. Then once they hear all that, they want to change. You know, well, I wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I know. I'm really, you know, Terry, I appreciate you talking to me. It's always a pleasure. Thank, thank you for taking the time, and, and I, I really do appreciate you being so. And your book, when when's this book going to be finished? Well, the, the, my second book, it, it's hard to write. You know, I, I'll sit down and I'll do some journaling, and then you had to. I had to take a break because it's, I, I see it getting to me, and but I've got a whole lot of it going on. And I'm not going to stop until I get it to where I want it. And then I'm going to go from there. I can't say when it'll come out, but uh, I'm hoping, you know, to make this happen. I, I, I've read your first book. Box Full of Nightmares. Yeah, this is uh, a lot of what has happened that the public knows about. You know, they're well aware of the case and things that's went on with the case. and But they're not aware of what uh, someone actually gone through. You know, and I can, I, like I said earlier, and if we all sit down and wrote a book about what we've been through, there's no telling, you know, what everybody involved on both sides, you know, has been through. And especially on our side, because we're the ones who have to live with what happened to our little boys. You know, so I can't say when, but I can say I'm, I'm working on it. And, and, and like I said, it's a tough thing to do, but I want to do it where, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's to help someone who has struggled in their journey. And maybe they can, you know, pick up a few things out of it and say, hey, I'm going to apply this, you know, and use it for their, in their life. Visit my YouTube channel because I got something coming up where uh, hopefully I get to record some of the music I wrote. Beautiful. What's, the, what's of, the name of your YouTube of, channel? Uh, Terry Hobbs. Yep. The, I, the I, scroll past all of, all of the goofy stuff. <laughs> I will put your link or I will put the link in the description of this video when it goes up. Well, thank you. But wait till I break out. See, I hadn't played on my electrics and I love my electrics, That's but wait till I do that. It sounds like a, a, a band. I love that. No, I'm, One man, man, band. Some of these songs, uh, Josh come out of pain, you know, out of the, what we've had to live with and deal with over the years. Some of them come from out of this, and, and there's some really, I think, to, to me, I think there's some really good songs. Yeah, I heard Reba McIntyre say one time that some of her songs come from her journey, you know, and and she and she went on to say that some of the best songs come out of people's lives. Yeah. So that's, you know, I've taken that and applied some of that to mine, a lot of it, actually and come up with some really good lyrics. One of the things that I hear a lot of people say, you know, well, why would, why would somebody write a book? Why would somebody do this? Uh, are they trying to profit off of this or this? Or that? You, you didn't ask for this. You didn't ask for, to be in this situation. It was bestowed what? upon you and your family. You didn't ask for any of this. Right. And let me say something about, you know, profited off of this. You know, the book has, it has brought money in, but it does not come, not one penny comes to Terry. So no, I have not made a penny off of the book, right? Very, very well said. And, 
And like I said, I really appreciate you t- taking the time to talk to me. And um, we'll talk again soon. I appreciate you, Josh, for having me on. And to everybody out there, don't let what other people say define who you are. Enjoy life, live life, because if you let it slip past you, you missed out on a lot of good things out here. I thank you, Josh. Well said, Terry. Thank you.